host of that show called Sports Plus Life. How's everybody doing today? All right, let's get down to business. Cut it off. Cut it off. All right. Again, my name is Brandon Bravon Towns. This is Sports Plus Life as we keep moseying on along in episode number 21. Yes, I keep count. Um, I need to start deleting some of these shits off my computer. I got them on YouTube now just to make my computer run faster. But anyway, how is everybody doing today? Okay, I just want to know, how is everybody doing today? And I'm saying that like I'm going to hear somebody be like, fine. But anyway, it's Thursday, our annual Thursday, January 17th, 2019. And um, this, I'll be honest with you, this, you know, I, it, it was brought to my attention at work how fast this January has been moving, and I'm like, well, you know, I've really never thought of it that way, but I'm like, now that you think about it, yeah, damn, it is about to be February, it's about to be the Super Bowl, it's, you know, pretty close to March Madness, and I'm like, okay, you know, it's everything is lighting up, got some big fights coming, and I'm like, yes, 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 you know, I'm, I'd be, I'd be hyped, you know, I love that shit, especially when I know this a uh, uh, big weekend coming up, like, like this weekend, um, with the fight between Manny Pacquiao and Adrian Broner on Saturday and then Sunday being Championship Sunday with the AFC and NFC Conference Championship game to determine who goes to the Super Bowl. College basketball is getting in the mix. Yes! Yes! You know, and the NBA is starting to be serious now. So, yes, this is this is a time, man. This is a great time. But I hope everybody is having a great and wonderful day. You know, weather's a little cloudy out here in the Richmond VA. Um, but, again... If you have not subscribed yet to this show or to my channel, Brave on Towns at YouTube, um, please do. Please subscribe. Um, I recently put a YouTube, I put a song on my YouTube page. Uh, like I said last episode, Swag on It There 3. It is, um, uh, like I said, I was going to put it on the um, on the show. I mean, I know you, you hear it playing in the background now. I was going to have that as a main play. But you guys, just go ahead and check it out. Swag on the day of three. Another track. I got another one bubbling in my head. A little R&B track bubbling in my head. Um, but anyway, you know, it's, it's, it's busy. It's busy. It's going to be a busy weekend. I'm telling you. It is going to definitely be a busy weekend. And, um, you know, without further ado, let's get to it. Okay, we going to start off where we normally start off at. Talking about the NFL. We are down to the final four. And I must say. I must say I will do a quick review of last week's divisional round. As far as picks goes, it was a bad week for me. It was. It was a bad, bad week. I picked, and I quote, for the Colts to beat the Kansas City Chiefs because I had to see it to believe it because the Chiefs lose it at home to the playoffs, at home in the playoffs too much. I had the Rams beating the Cowboys, and then I had the Chargers beating the Patriots, and I had the Eagles going with my heart, the Eagles beating the Saints. Needless to say, I was wrong about three of them. You know, the Chiefs, I, the, their defense shocked the hell out of me. I did not see that coming against the Indianapolis Colts, who had just been red hot. Their defensive line and their offensive line kicked ass all day. All day. And, um... And then um, the damn Chargers, man, the damn Chargers. You know, the, 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 the Los Angeles Chargers should be ashamed of themselves because they just did not show up to play. Gus Bradley, the defensive coordinator for the motherfucking Chargers, should be ashamed of himself. Because you're going to sit there and run a zone, seven defensive backs, and not put any pressure on Tom Brady and let him pick you apart like he's some scrub-ass quarterback. This is Tom Brady. Put a helmet on his ass. I mean, and, and, and if you, you came out and you wanted to try that experience, experiment, okay, fine, cool. But by the time it's 14-7 to 7 and he's walked up and down the field on your defense the first two drives, 
that's when you that's when the light bulb is supposed to go out uh go off in your stupid ass head and say hey this scheme isn't working maybe we should try more man-to-man coverage since their receivers aren't really that great and let's put some pressure let's send some blitzes no they keep the same defense out there the same scheme and you schemed yourself it was 35 to 7 at halftime and I was disgusted because I, like most of the people outside of the state of Massachusetts, am sick of the New England Patriots. But I'm going to get to them later because, oh, they just, oh, they, oh, they, they, they piss me off today. They really piss me off. But, um, but they're off to another eighth straight AFC championship, which, which is a remarkable achievement. I ain't going to front, but I'm tired of them. Like everybody else outside of the state of Massachusetts and these bandwagon Patriot fans that are sprinkled throughout the country. And I do mean sprinkled. And um, then the game I, I chose with my heart, the Eagles versus the Saints. Um, oh, my goodness. The Eagles started off balling. First play of the game, Drew Brees gets picked off. And uh, Nikki Foles goes right down the field on the first two drives. And they're 14 nothing, And they did jack squat the rest of the game. Now, mind you, their defense fought as hard as they could against New Orleans in that dome. The final score was 20 to 14, and everything was just stacked, even, even with no points to show for, barely any first downs after the first quarter. Still, with less than three minutes to go, Nick Foles had the ball and was driving for the game winning touchdown. And I said, he is going to pull this shit off. And then um, they get a penalty. Uh, rough in the passer penalty, 15 yards. They're down to about the Saints, 35. They run the ball with Darren Sproles on first down. Okay, whatever. And then it's it's close to the two-minute warning. And I'm like, wait, just wait for the two-minute warning. Just just don't run another play. Get yourself together. So they, they, you know, they try to get cute and run another play. Nick Foles throws the pass and is on target. Hits Alshon Jeffries, goes right through his hands, and it gets intercepted. Ball game. Ain't that a bitch. Ah. <sighs> My Eagles, I have to, uh, 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 and I know I'm a Bronco fan, but I mean, you know, I love the Eagles too, but I have to give you guys this one for that, uh, Philly. I mean, come on, man. Take your damn time. Get yourself together. Cause I, I mean, I just, you just had that feeling that if this game went into uh, under two minutes and Philly's driving, you just get a feeling that they're going to pull that one off. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, it happened how it happened. They had a great defense of their title, so definite salute. I still think I still would not, I repeat, I would not get rid of Nick Foles. I would not. Now, I know you don't want to franchise tag him and have a $20 million backup, but, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. I would. You just can't trust Carson Wentz's health right now. And I think Doug Peterson needs to dumb down the playbook like he does for Nick Foles because it works. I mean, maybe he should do that for Carson Wentz so it's less stress on on uh, him as, you know, running that position. But I do not get rid of Nick Foles. No way. No way. I mean, he's the best relief pitcher in football. And like I gave the comparison last week to uh, Matt Flynn, the quarterback, the uh, former quarterback for Green Bay, some guys just do better in certain areas. You know, I don't think Nick Foles wants to leave Philadelphia. I actually think Nick think that Nick Foles would be fine and happy being a, a backup quarterback because all the pressure ain't him. He on ain't on him. He's not getting all of the scrutiny and all the criticism that comes with being a starting quarterback. I think he is just fine with being a relief pitcher, especially he can lean back on that Super Bowl. He can say fuck it, say what you want to say about me. I got a Super Bowl uh, MVP. I beat Tom Brady. I threw for three touchdowns and caught a touchdown pass, you motherfuckers. So what you going to say? I'm pretty Nicky Foles, bitch. Anyway, so I was wrong about those three games, but the game I was right about, oh boy, I was right about them Los Angeles Rams putting them goddamn Dallas Cowboys out of there and everybody else's misery. They ran the ball right down Dallas's great defense's throat. They did exactly what the Indianapolis Colts did to him. They bitched him at the line of scrimmage, and they beat him down on the defensive line, the offensive line, C.J. Anderson, Bronco. 
Super Bowl champion, had a game. Todd Gurley, best in the business, money time, had a game. And now I'm going to say this, and I want to make myself clear. See, I'm not like all of these other podcasts or sports talk shows or whatever. For one, I'm not funded. Hmm. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure somebody said, well, with the language, you won't get funded. Look, this is unedited. When somebody wants to come sponsor me, I will clean that up gladly. But until then, fuck the Dallas Cowboys. I am not like one of these sports talk shows that's going to talk about them all year long when they don't need or deserve to be talked about. They rallied from a three and five record to win their division. Good for them. They won a playoff game. Good for them. Did they get to a conference championship game? No. I was in middle school last time that happened. Did they get to a Super Bowl? Obviously not because they didn't get to a conference championship game. When's the last time they won a Super Bowl? God only knows. There are players on that team that wasn't even alive the last time they won a Super Bowl. So I'm not going to talk about America's scheme like everybody else does when they don't need or deserve the attention. They're done. Fuck them. I will see about that. I'll talk about them when the draft comes, if it's necessary, and when next season comes. And I'm talking about everybody else in the NFC and the NFC East. Bye bye, Dallas. Rotten hell, bitches. See you next season. Actually, hope I don't. Anyway, so that sets up the NFC championship game uh, between the Rams and the Saints. I've been saying, you know, everybody pretty much has been saying this since probably about week 10. That it was coming down to the Rams and the Saints. We thought maybe Philly could throw in. Uh, we thought maybe Philly could throw a kink in it. You know, assuming they got in. A lot of people had high hopes about Chicago, and then that last bitch ass team that I just named um, said I wasn't going to talk about. Um, so, but it it is what it is. Class tells over time, and these two are the class of the division. So, with that being said. This will be the 3 o'clock game, the NFC Championship game. I have been saying the Rams all year in the Super Bowl, so I can't turn back on it now. I think uh, it's going to be a different game. Now, yes, they did meet back, I want to say it was week 11, I think. I believe it was week 11. And the Saints jumped out on them. The Rams made a comeback. Ultimately, the Saints won, and I, I really hope this. I really hope that this does not happen. I don't want Marcus Peters to even think about seeing any part of Michael Thomas this time around because Michael Thomas smoked you. Now, Marcus Peters is talking a lot of, lot of, lot of rah-rah, talking a lot of rah-rah at the, at the Saints coach, Sean Payton, but this will be a different game because of, I'll tell you why, Aqib Tlaib did not play in that first game. So I'm pretty sure he will do most of the guarding on Michael Thomas. The Rams' defense is healthy. They are very healthy. Very, very healthy. And that's going to make a big difference. There was no C.J. Anderson in the first game. None. And they have found a running attack where, you know, everybody was saying all of this pressure is on Jared Goff, this, that, and the third. Well, shit. (laughs) When you have two running backs that can average over 100 yards per game, and this is what gets lost. People are all about, oh, my God, C.J. Anderson. C.J. Anderson ain't new to this. C.J. Anderson was a... Very good, high-quality, top-notch running back for the Denver Broncos during his time there. I don't really don't understand why they let him go. Well, okay, salary cap reasons, because statistically his best season for the Broncos was last year in 2017. And um, C.J. Anderson is a, is a running back. He looks like he's gained some weight. I mean, he looks he looks like a little bowling ball now, but he gets stronger as the game goes along. He's a north-south runner. He – I mean, he will go and get you a hundred yards. He, I mean, he, I mean, it doesn't matter to him. If you say here, CJ, we're going to run it twenty-five times, you probably get about 80, 85 yards. Fine, give him the ball. Plus, that takes pressure off of money time. Todd Gurley. Okay, so I think that is def- a definite advantage for the Rams. And of course, the Saints have their their, their combo as well, Ingram and Kamara. But the Saints have seen, and the Rams have seen that. So I just think it's a, it, the Rams are a different team than the, the team that they faced in Week 11. And I do think that the Rams, I have said I have to stick with them. Now on the AFC side, Kansas City proved me wrong. You know, they won a home playoff game. 
This is obviously different than the 2003 uh, Kansas City Chiefs that I've been comparing them to the whole time because they won a playoff game and their defense showed up. So maybe all it takes is one. They're going up against the New England Patriots. And I'm going to tell you something. I hope the Kansas City Chiefs stomp a mud hole in the New England Patriots' ass. Another rematch of a game earlier this season. It was a Sunday night game. I believe it was in New England. They won 43-40. to All I'm going to do is say this, because both of these teams look pretty much the same. I mean, the Chiefs don't have Kareem Hunt. The Patriots don't have Josh Gordon. But if, if Kansas City's defense, because I will tell you this, Kansas City's defense, as horrible as they've been all season, they're not going to stand there and just let Tom Brady throw without blitzing him. Oh, hell no. No, that's not going to happen. They led the NFL in sacks. I mean, I give them that much. I don't think they deserved a Pro Bowl on defense, but they did lead the NFL in sacks. They did get at Andrew Luck. I did not see that coming. And if they can do that against the Patriots in that stadium, because now it is a home field advantage. In that stadium, with that offense, and by the way, that offense looked amazing as it has all season, and it was snowing in Kansas City, and they still looked amazing. I hope they dust the Patriots off. And now, let me get to the Patriots. Now, all of a sudden, after the game is over, Tom Brady wants to say to the interviewer from CBS, I know we suck and we can't win a game. And now, all of a sudden, Julian Edelman, because they have opened up as a three-point underdog, a three-point underdog, and the Patriots are, are acting like that this is the end of the world. Maybe they're trying to use the rallying cry that the Eagles did last year with the dog mask uh, for signaling underdog. But I'm sorry, not going to work. I'm not buying it. Shut the fuck up, you crying little bitches. This is the first time I can ever say that I've seen the New England Patriots act like some little punks. Julian Edelman putting out shirts, bet against us. Okay, motherfucker, I will bet against you. I think you're going to lose. I mean, let's, I mean and this is, this is why I think the Patriots are acting like some spoiled little brat-ass punks. In the last, this will be, this coming up game on Sunday will be the Patriots' 25th playoff game since 2006. That is an amazing, amazing feat. I ain't going to front. But in the previous 24 games, do you know how many times they were actually the underdog? One. One time. Once. Once. That was in the 2013 AFC Championship game when they had to come to Mile High Stadium and play Peyton Manning, who was the MVP for the Denver Broncos, and we smoked them. But I ain't see them putting out all that bet against us and, oh, we're underdog. They ain't do that crap when they was coming to Denver <laughs> because they, they, yeah, they ain't do all that when they was coming to Denver. Now, all of a sudden, you're an underdog for the second time in 25 playoff games. You want to say, well, we suck. We can't win any games. Oh, yeah, bet against us. Shut up. Shut up. That further makes me want to root against you. That further makes me hope that you do not part the Red Sea. That further makes me hope that every other play Tom Brady is on his back or on his face. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just keeping it 100. And, um, I, of course, when I come to you guys on Saturday, I will have more. I mean, but I'm, I mean, I've made my predictions. I'll just go into further detail. Um, I am picking the Super Bowl to be the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Los Angeles Rams, the new breed. The new breed. Jared Goff and Patrick Mahomes. Now, now that I've touched on that, let's get to some NBA, shall we? A couple of nights ago in Denver, the Nuggets hosted the Golden State Warriors uh, with first place in the Western Conference on the line. And... Um, the Golden State Warriors reminded everybody just who the hell they are and just why nobody else has a chance. They went into Denver, and this is in four quarters, not overtime. They beat the Nuggets by 31 points, 142 to 111, scoring 51 points in the first quarter. 
51 points in the first quarter. Really? So, I mean, this is, so, Denver, they're an up-and-coming team. But they had to get smacked down. They think they're on this level. They are not. That's all Golden State was trying to say. You think you're on our level? You are not. Not even close. If Golden State and Denver meet in the playoffs, it's a sweep. Maybe mercifully the Nuggets could win a game, but no, I see that as a sweep. And then um, last night, last night, and um, and by the way, in that game against the Nuggets, Steph Curry, um, that game against the Nuggets, Steph Curry, 31 points. Klay Thompson, 31 points. Kevin Durant, 27 points. Bruh, bruh. Like, really? You know, and then the next night, they were at home against the New Orleans Pelicans. And I was watching that game. I didn't stay up to watch that game. It was a late game. I'm not going to lie. But uh, I saw the Pelicans had them by like 17, 18 points. And I was like, well, maybe um, Golden State's getting a little bit of jet lag because, you know, they did just blow the roof off of uh, Denver. No, they just came back and beat the Pelicans, 147-140. Steph Curry, 41 points. You know what I mean? I mean, like, I mean, I I don't want to blow everybody's basketball fantasies away from them, but, bro, it's when this and this team, you, you when they are locked in and focused, you're not beating them. Now, there are a couple of teams that I believe would give them a fight, give them a run for their money. But all in all, you're not beating Golden State. And then guess what? Tomorrow on Friday, Boogie Cousins makes his debut. Now, actually, that's going to take a while for him to get his uh, uh, NBA legs back under him because it's been almost a year since he played. But by the time the playoffs start, Boogie Cousins is going to be just fine. He's going to be just fine. And the Warriors are going to be just fine. I mean, I mean, people are, are going nuts over with the Warriors with KD and Draymond. Man, they don't give two shits about the regular season now. They have been to four straight NBA Finals. They have. They don't care about this time of the year. They really, really don't. You know, they're just going through the motions. They're going to play, you know, just well enough to make sure that they get home court or at least will have, you know, home court in the finals, even though they'll need to do some work for that. They're behind Toronto. But, I mean, I really don't think they don't care, right, because they know when they need to make a statement in a game, they do. When they need to get serious, they do. You know, as long as they're healthy. And then that's a wrap. Now, another interesting game last night was Boston uh, hosting Toronto. Of course, the Raptors are number one in the East, and Boston, to this point, has been a disappointment because of all the depth, all the talent on that team, and they're really underachieving, being the uh, fifth spot in the uh, fifth spot in the East. And Kyrie Irving has called out a lot of his teammates, which not everybody, Jalen Brown, has taken, you know, has has felt good about. So last night, Kyrie took, oh, Kyrie reminded people who the hell he is, and that's why I rock with Kyrie because he has got that Kobe in his blood. Give me the ball. Get the hell out the way. I got this. Just be ready if I pass the ball. And Kyrie, he did it all. He made buckets. He dropped dimes. Uh, Boston came from behind to beat Toronto. And then he called LeBron James to apologize for now he understands what it's like to be a leader and the criticism that comes with being a leader. Okay, I mean, I guess that was cool. I mean, whatever. I mean, it, yeah, you get into that point in your career, you know, mid to late 20s. You're an NBA champion now. But what I saw on the court was why I rock with this dude. This dude, I mean, his 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 shot to give them a, a, a 111-106 lead over Kawhi Leonard, that was one of them shots from Uncle Drew. He was damn near half court and let a rip. <laughs> I mean, and that was... That was cool. So the NBA is definitely heating up. The NBA is definitely heating up, and let's get ready. Like I said, you know, it, winter is in the middle of winter, but um, springtime is coming. Everything is is fitting to heat up. So I just wanted to get that out the way with the NBA. 
And now, of course, we all know Saturday is fight night. And in the main event will be uh, the WBA welterweight secondary champion. I don't even know what the hell that means. I'm just going to say the WBA welterweight champion, Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao, against uh, Adrian the Problem Broner. And they just had their last um, press conference yesterday, and it, it was it was very interesting. It was very interesting. And so I'll, I'll give you guys a listen. Let me start with Manny Pacquiao. Manny you um, are fighting back here at the uh, in the United States and here at the MGM Grand Garden where you fought 13 times before. How does it feel to be back here in the United States and at this arena? I feel excited. Uh, I feel excited to be back here in, in this arena in, at, at the MGM because this is a, a memorable place for me because my first fight here in America is, is, is um, at MGM. Um, that was uh, 2001, June 23, 2001. Now, you, in your last two fights, you've talked about how you've made some uh, changes in, tra in terms of how you train, uh, kind of acknowledging the fact that you're 40 and that you have to kind of do some different things. How has that helped you and what have you done? Okay, uh, we, we, uh, we study uh, properly, I'm studying my body, uh, my body condition, and then I learned that uh, when you get this age uh, of um, it's a, age of 40, uh, when you push yourself at and train in heavy training in a day, uh, you should uh, balance your body and you, know, you, know, you should uh, uh, watch your body to, uh, to have recovery at overnight. If not, then uh, make your body, uh, let your body rest. Uh, uh, and then uh, after that, then push again to, uh, to a heavy training. We'll turn to Adrian Broner, who, uh, Adrian, you uh, mentioned to some of the press that you, you see this fight as turning the page, um, and, and, and a win would mean so much to you. And explain a little bit on how it is turning the page for you. I ain't gonna lie to you, bro. I don't fuck with you, bro. I don't fuck with you. you. You be talking too much shit about me on Twitter, bro. And, um, I'm gonna let you get me? Yeah, you bitch-ass nigga, I'm gonna let you know. And, um, um, and, and I'm just being real, bro. Like, I just already feel like you against me. So I'm not against anybody, but this, this isn't about me, it's about you. I'd rather Roy Jones or, or Stephen A. Smith ask me some questions. I don't fuck with you. Okay, that's fine. So, Adrian Broner's not going to answer any more questions. I think I'll take that as a no, and we'll let you answer, ask him all the questions uh, in the future. But now it's time for the fighters to face. Well, let me, let me ask, before we get to that, I will go to some of the, uh, to your trainer, Kevin Cunningham. Kevin, you talked about the, uh, the, it's uh, gang, gang, if I don't fuck with you, they don't fuck with you. Well, I think it's their choice, isn't it? Man, gang, gang, you, you know what that means? Gang, gang, take the air out of love. It's over, brother. Well, Kevin, what do you say to all this? He's done. All right. Um, it's not about me. It's about the fighters. So what do you say we have them uh, do a face-off for you? And it's time for the face-off between the two fighters. Let's, let's get that going, and that'll end the festivities. <laughs> Don't you just love Adrian Broner? I mean, isn't Adrian Broner just a household name? Wouldn't you just love to have a general conversation with me? I'm just playing. I mean, that's crazy. That's a trip. That that kind of um, reminded me of when Floyd Mayweather came at Larry Merchant after his fight against Victor Ortiz. I mean, he was just straight up with it. You know, they should have had the, the, the Big Sean song playing in the background. I don't fuck with you. <laughs> they should have, man. They should have. But um, I tell you what. You know, Adrian Broner just came at a Hall of Famer. You know, a Hall of Famer and Al Bernstein, who's uh, absolutely great, one of my favorite commentators uh, with Showtime. So if you want to come at him like that, bro, you better win. Because if you think he ever talked stuff about you on Twitter before, don't lose this fight. And definitely don't get knocked out. Because everybody is going to come at you after that. Everybody. You maybe should have waited until if you won the fight and then really pulled the Floyd during the interview after the fight and said, you know what you had to say. But, bro, if you're going to come at him, if you're going to come at the, the media like that, you better win, my dude. That's all I'm going to say. That is all I'm going to say. It is sad. That fight is Saturday night. 
I um I want to say I don't because I have I had depends on what kind of shape Broner is in because Adrian Broner is by far uh, an extraordinary talent in the ring. I mean, he is, uh, he's a very uh, precise, accurate puncher. Um, and he's not afraid to, he's, you know, he's got heart. He's not afraid to go stand in there and fight with you. But the thing with him is that he, for one, he hasn't seemed to have taken his craft, but so seriously. My thing with him is that he seemed that he was, it seemed like he was more important with being famous than, you know, actually doing what you had to do to keep the fame because you got yourself up there to get the fame you know what i'm saying to earn the fame but it's like you, you slacked off once you got there and you started getting in trouble and all of this other stuff you know and in your in his fights it's just like he doesn't throw enough punches he shouldn't have lost to marcos madonna he shouldn't have lost to sean porter even though sean porter is almost like playing football mikey garcia eh, eh, maybe because mikey garcia is a bad boy you know he could fight but now, if this is if you're ever gonna do something, shed your underachiever label. The time is now, bro. And I'm gonna tell you something. I'm a Manny Pacquiao fan. I'm a Manny Pacquiao fan. But Pacquiao is 40 years old. He is coming off of a knockout, off of a broken down Lucas Matisse. Matisse was done. And I'm not taking away Pacquiao for handling his business. He did what a champion's supposed to do. But Adrian Broner. If you are going to have another big time fight and this is your first time headlining a pay-per-view and people are kind of just shrugging their shoulders at it. Not at Pacquiao, but it's you because people think that you are a clown, bro. Because of all of your antics and stuff like that that just happened uh, in the press conference with Al Bernstein. So now you got to really bring it. You got to really bring it in the ring. Straight up. And I think it'll be a very entertaining fight. And I definitely, I definitely look forward to seeing it. Okay? I really do. So, with that being said, and, and please believe. Oh, and but you know what? Before, before, I get off of, um, before I get off of the boxing, um, they're trying to finalize a date for the rematch with Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. They're saying it's going to be in the United States this time. Anthony Joshua wanted to be slick and be like, I'm free to fight. What was it? Uh, April 13th. Knowing that the WBC was going to mandate a rematch for this fight. I don't dislike Anthony Joshua, but I thought that was a slick little, little that was a little bit of a punk move. Because you knew a, a rematch was going to be in demand. And what struck me even more was that Lennox Lewis, your countryman, a former great heavyweight champion, a Hall of Famer, came out public and said Anthony Joshua doesn't want any part of Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury. That made me raise my eyebrows like, like, woo. I mean, is he trying to kind of slide tip, promote it, maybe get under AJ's skin and say, oh, I'll show you, I'll show you. But like I said, him saying that he's going to fight on April the 13th was a slick move because it's not going to be against Deontay Wilder or Tyson Fury. So, and then, and yesterday it was announced that on April 20th, 420, how about that? <laughs> Terrence Crawford will be defending the WBO welterweight title against Amir Khan. You know, they, um, so boxing is definitely heating up. You know, expect to see some great unification fights in the future. Who knows, maybe uh, the uh, Terrence Crawford could, the winner of Terrence Crawford, Amir Khan fights the winner of uh, Manny Pacquiao and Adrian Broner, even though I know that Manny Pacquiao is seeking the rematch with Floyd Mayweather in May. I wouldn't I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. But um, Keith Thurman is slated to fight uh, next week. Um, Errol Spence has a fight coming up. So boxing is definitely looking up, looking up. I can't wait. Saturday night, fight night. I'm getting hype. And with that being said, what a buzzer, what a buzzer, what a buzzer. Okay. Now, um, I was at work the other day, and my coworkers were giving me some ideas. And God bless them. God bless them. They come up with, like, some really good ideas with stuff for me to talk about. Some of it be like, some of the stuff I'd be like, whoa. You know, yeah, yeah. but um, this one is, you know, it's, it's cool. It, it's, a leg, it's a legit question because it really got me thinking, you know, should a woman 
propose to a man. Well, well, well. Now, first things first, you know, I'm all, you know, it's great. You know, I know how the tradition is, you know, men get on one knee, they propose, and that's great. That's wonderful. Um, But, like, the, you know, I think it's a legit question. Should a woman propose to a man? Well, well, well. Um, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. If a woman wants to propose to a man, I'm going to say this. Why the hell not? Why the hell not? You know, why not? If you feel that strongly about a woman, uh, about your man in your relationship, that you feel like you would want to ask him, you would want to beat him to the punch, then go for it. I'm serious. Go for it. You know, I mean, I mean, and I know because I'm going to say this, I know people will be like, um, well, you know, it's tradition for a man. Hold on now. Hold on. Because now we in the age right now. We in the age right now. Ho hold on, homie. We in the age right now where we want equality. I can do anything a man can do, and that's cool. I'm all for it. That's what's up. Do whatever you want. You you know, uh, trying to piss standing up will will give you a run for for your money. But just like a man having a baby will give you a run for your money. So um, so I'm all for it. If you feel like as a woman, you want to get down on one knee. And propose to your man and say, baby, I know this ain't how it's usually done, but will you marry me? Would you do it? Or would you be afraid of the answer that you would get? <laughs> okay, well, you know what? You don't have to, you know what? For one, I don't want to hear nothing about tradition. I don't want to hear a damn thing about tradition. Because all I hear all the time is that this is a new day. This is a new day. This is a new age. Blase, blase, blase. I respect your opinion, and you don't have to get on one. Now, if I'm talking about me personally, you don't have to get on one knee. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to do all of that stuff. But, like I said, don't say anything about tradition because I'm going to tell you straight up. I think what the issue is why you would feel some type of way about proposing to your man is because you might be afraid of the answer that you get. I don't want to hear nothing about tradition because it is it is pretty much well known and it's always thought out that men never want to settle down, that we don't we don't settle down that eventually we surrender and just put our wrist out and let you put the shackles on us or the shackles on our feet, the old ball and chain and all that other, all that other stuff. You know what I'm saying? But as a woman, if you really, cause you, you just said it yourself. If, if, you know, if my man really loves me, he will ask me to marry him. Okay. But what if he does? What if he does? But what's wrong with you beating him to it? I'm listening. Come on now. You live, you live with brave on you live with Brandon brave on. Why you got to be in front of your family? Why you got to be in front of your family? Why you got to be in front of your family? Oh, no, no, see, 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 you miss, see, I, I didn't say nothing about a ring. I didn't say nothing about a ring. Forgive you? <laughs> Holla at you, boy. And you said that, not me. 
Like I said, okay, and I'm and, and if and if any and if any other woman is listening to this right now, I'm pretty sure they like you. Tell them, girl. You tell them, sister soldier. You tell them. But to that, I'm like this. Anybody, anybody who wants to say they wouldn't do it or wants to throw to this tradition into it, I see nothing but fear. I see nothing but fear because I think I really think that a woman would be afraid of the reaction that they get. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there because. Christy, who you talking about? Jim Jones is Christy. I don't even like her. Well, you know what? I don't pay attention. I honestly, I don't pay attention to reality shows, and I don't know what goes on. But you know, there is nothing traditional about marriage, especially in this country now. This country makes reality shows about marrying a complete stranger, and you tripping off of, uh, uh, and you and you worried about what uh, uh, being a woman and proposing to a man. But you get on a reality show, not you, but you get on a reality show and marry a complete stranger. Like that feedback. You could propose to a woman and, and, and you would never see the light of day of the owl. That's just how I look. That's just me being totally honest. I mean, yeah, I, can, I mean, yeah, we can go. We can go bye bye birdie and be engaged for like 15 years. But only thing I'm saying is, hey, just because, like you just said it, just because you propose to somebody doesn't mean you'll ever see the light of a marriage owl or, or a government building or whatever. But. All I'm saying is, what woman has the kahunas, the grapefruits, the onions to actually do it? Who feels that strongly about their man to do it? Because nothing else in this world is traditional. Nothing. Nothing. We post on social media when we're taking a shit. So nothing that we do now is is con- is conventional or traditional. I'm proud of you of stepping into the dungeon with your boy. I am. You damn right. I'm representing. You know, I'm going hard. I'm going hard. May tell you what. You wait till I post this on YouTube and you listen because we're going to bust your bitch ass Patriots ass. Well, not we, but the Chiefs are going to bust your bitch ass Patriots ass. Yeah, they're going to blow y'all out in the playoffs. I don't think so. I don't think so. They won. We won by three points. We won by a landslide last week. Three points ain't no landslide. That's a field goal. That's a close game. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see. I got money on the damn Chiefs, and you damn right I'm repping my Broncos. I got money on the Chiefs. They ain't going to let me down. And you know who bet me already. You know who bet me already. Take a guess. You already know. Yeah, he got the Patriots. He ain't learned yet. Anyway, well, look, I definitely respect I definitely respect your opinion on the topic of would uh, should a woman propose to a man? 
you know, my thing is, if you feel strong enough about your man, don't be so proud and get so stuck in tradition, especially with the way that tradition is now. We want equality. I'm all for it. A woman has just as much right to do anything that a man can do. I can dig it. I love it. I respect it. And I'm all for it. Try, try to pee standing up. That'll give you a run for your money. Or just like a man trying to have a baby. That'll give you a run for your money as well. But, um, you know, just me, on the other hand, it's to me, sometimes you just got to let that pride thing go. You know? All right, so let me ask you something else. If a man proposes to a woman and she says no, does that end the relationship? If a man gets down on his knees and says, baby, I love you. I want to be together with you for the rest of my life, for the rest of our life. Will you marry me? And she says, um, no. Is that it? Is that the end of the relationship? If a man proposes to me and I tell him no, is that the end of the relationship? Mm-hmm. That's the question. That yeah, that's the question. Facts. 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 Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let me. Oh, no, I could definitely respect it. I could definitely respect it. Definitely. But uh, let me rephrase that question. What if you're in front of a big ass group of people and you ask your woman to marry you and she says no and straight shuts you down in front of everybody? You think the relationship going to last then? Yo, yo, <laughs> yo, I respect your opinion. I respect your opinion, but I'm going to tell you this. If you, first of all, if a man feels confident enough to marry, to ask a woman to marry him in a room full of people and you get shut down, that's a shot to the heart. That's like being cheated on. That shit just sticks to you like, ooh, ah, that shit just sticks to you. So I don't know. I mean, hope. I mean, hopefully you, but you would, you would think, but hold on, you would think, you would think that um, people who get married, well, who want to ask somebody to marry them, have had these conversations about taking the step to the next level before they just outright go out and ask, ask them. This is just random questions because if you have any confidence issue about being a husband or a wife and you still ask the question, you're dumb. You're dumb. And you set yourself up for that failure. But no, nah, the relationship wouldn't last. There's some women out there that may feel like they're not confident in being a wife right now. You know what I'm saying? And that's probably why. Well, is it that the woman doesn't feel confident in being a wife of why they won't ask the man to marry them? Or is it they're worried that the, uh, that the man is not ready to be a husband, which is usually the universal answer to that question? Well, let me tell you something. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If the man is not ready to be a husband, there's a strong possibility that he's not even ready to be in a relationship. So you got problems off the bat from that. What's up, Tasia? Yeah, well, 
as long as staying true to that family is part of the goal, because, you know, that's something that gets lost in a lot of relationships. You know, it's something that gets lost and it's, it's fucked up, but it's true. Men and women gotta stop wasting people's time because it's a lot of people in here in a relationship just to say they in one but still doing what they want to do. If you're not gonna be committed in that relationship, what makes you think I'm gonna think that you're gonna? Uh oh. Uh oh. Might have lost the feed. Might have lost the feed, but no real talk. Oh. Real talk. Um. That was that was some deep conversation. That was definitely some deep conversation. Uh, lost the feed. I don't have the greatest signal up in here, so I, I do what I can when I'm Facebook live. But, you know, that was great. That was great conversation. You know, that's why I can't. Uh-oh, you're back. You're back. Hey, you're back. I had lost you for a second. What up? What it do? <laughs> no, nah, but that's deep, though. Facts, definitely, definitely facts, definitely facts. Um, I think I might have lost Adriana again, but um, anyway, this is good. Like, this is really good. This is awesome. Um, and she's still talking. I done lost signal with her twice, and she's still talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. Man, ain't you in Vegas? <laughs> well, you guys just think about think about how much fun think about how much fun that this just was just doing this one little topic. Just imagine how it's gonna be once I start doing my um my podcast live and I start having guests. It's going to be dope. You know, this is my 21st episode, and this is the first time I've actually had somebody, you know, other than myself speaking in on there with me. I've had a lot of views, you know, as I'm going on Facebook Live. I apologize to my Facebook Live people for my, you know, signal not being as strong. Hey, all I can say is boost mobile, motherfuckers. Boost mobile. So, anyway. <laughs> Hey, you know, I got a bunch of people out here that want uh, that want to come and want to have me interview them because let them know that's that sports plus life. That's how we're going to do it. Um, trust me, just a hey, just uh, Adriana, look out, uh, look on your Facebook um, page in about the next hour and a half, maybe two hours, because this episode has gone longer than I thought, you know, with the conversation. But I love it. So I'm going to you know, I'm going to tag you in the post. You can go back and listen to it. But um, anyway, yo, it's your boy, Brandon Bravon Towns. This has been another episode of Sports Plus Life. Hit that subscribe button. It's your mans. I'm out. Peace.